Good morning and welcome to the NMPA Black Press USA live stream. I am your host, Dr. Nasinga Burton, and I am elated, if you cannot tell, to be sitting here and talking to the 10th president, and it's your 10th anniversary, I do believe, uh, Dr. David Wilson, president of Morgan State University. Welcome, Dr. Wilson. Dr. Burton, thank you for having me. Indeed, it is my 10th anniversary, if you can believe that, to the day, as a matter of fact, I started yes. here. July 1 of 2010. Yes, I do my research. I do my research. <laughs> so glad to have you and thank you for spending some time with us today. Um, let's just jump right into this. First of all, tell me what's great. Tell me the good things that are happening at Morgan State University. Uh, do we have perhaps an entire year for this interview? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, first of all, I am so honored to have been given the opportunity to lead this institution for the last 10 years. Uh, it is truly a national treasure within the higher education enterprise and certainly within HBCUs. Uh, uh, Morgan, we have a student population here of about 8,000 students uh, coming from about 35 uh, states across the United States uh, and over 60 countries across the world. Uh, mm -hmm. We are number one in the United States in producing African-American electrical engineers. Uh, we're number one in civil engineering. We're number one in industrial engineering. And we are number five in the United States of America in producing black engineers in all fields. Uh, we also have uh, equally impressive numbers in uh, the sciences, uh, in mathematics, uh, in the fine and performing arts uh, as well. Uh, our students here are performing on the national stage. Uh, they're competing with students all over the world and they are bringing home the top prizes. And so I'm just so excited to uh, see them um, understand what it means to understand uh, when we say at Morgan to them that you're here because we're growing the future uh, yeah. and the world. And Dr. Bird, they are internalizing that. They know that I am that future and Morgan has to prepare me, which Morgan is doing in ensuring that when I walk across the stage, I will have everything and more needed to get out there and lead this world. And we are non-apologetic uh, in saying to our students, that's how it's Fantastic. Uh, Jelani Bakari is saying that you're doing fantastic things. We had a good morning shout out um, to you as well. So I'm sure the Morgan State Bears will be uh, chiming in with us. So uh, you call uh, Morgan State, Diane Hawker, strong supporter of the Afro-American newspaper. Yes, you are. Yeah, um, best paper in the country, you know, so we love it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And we are, just so that people know, um, the Black Press is celebrating its 193rd year of uh, existence and uh, NMPA is celebrating its 80th anniversary. So we're excited about the Black Press all the time, but we're particularly excited um, right now. But at any rate, you, um, Morgan State is obviously a national treasure, but from what I understand of Mar Morgan State, and you know, I spent 10 years in Baltimore, um, is that I think of Morgan State as an international treasure, um, because treasure, because you all have fantastic partnerships uh, with entities, um, uh, in the diaspora, particularly uh, on the continent of Africa and the countries of uh, Ghana and Nigeria. Can you talk to us a little bit about those programs that you have? I know you've uh, had three recently approved programs for Ghana, um, but can you talk to us about Nigeria, the um, the TET fund, um, as you will? Oh, yes. So we are very excited to uh, have struck up a partnership with the TET fund in Nigeria. Uh, mm -hmm. I really want to give a huge shout out to uh, the executive secretary there, Dr. Bagaro. Um, we um, entertained him here at Morgan. He came last fall. I uh, had a wonderful, wonderful uh, a trip uh, here to uh, our institution and began to understand just uh, how prolific we are here in churning out PhDs uh, for faculties all over the world. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we were able to uh, form a partnership between Morgan and the TET Fund of Nigeria, where the TET Fund is going to support up to uh, 50 lecturers at public universities all over Nigeria uh, who want to come to Morgan, get their PhDs, and then go back to Nigeria uh, and strengthen those faculties. Uh, and this particular arrangement right now uh, is a five-year arrangement uh, that could stand to uh, educate about 250 uh, Nigerian professors uh, with an opportunity for us to renew it for another five years. Uh, so we, we are very excited about that um, because we 
uh, certainly have a very strong uh, Nigerian presence here on our campus with regard to our students. Uh, and this is another way uh, for this partnership actually to uh, materialize. Uh, and also, Dr. Burton, you know, we understand that Africa is our future in addition to the future that we have embraced for 153 years uh, in our domestic space. You know, Africa mm -hmm. 1.2 billion people. You know, Africa is only second to China in terms of the most populated continent. And so with that, and, and it's like 50% of the population in Africa is under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. the existing universities don't have the capacity to educate the population at the higher ed level that is so necessary in order for the continent uh, to lead the world, if you will, which they must do uh, in, in, in terms of the future of, of, of the world. Uh, and so uh, we understand that, and we are raising our hand with the first HBCU. Uh, to have a physical presence in uh, Africa. We do have a physical presence in Ghana, where we will be delivering the three programs that you mentioned. Uh, and we are in partnership with AUCC, uh, the uh, Africa University uh, College of Communications, in doing that. And we are really looking to a Morgan State Africa campus in the future, where we will be attracting students from all over the continent who, for whatever reason, given the immigration issues, and we won't go into that. Uh, yeah to the United States, but still desire a Morgan degree to get that degree on the continent itself. Yes. And so you, you mentioned Ghana um, and the year of the return um, has been very important for 2020 um, or uh, 2019 rather. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, because I know that you won the HBCU <laughs> award um, um, <clears throat> for global leadership, um, which is Fantastic. Congratulations. But also talk about like how how that came about, like and how you felt, um, because, you know, you had some traditional ceremonies happen around that as well um, in Ghana, um, Accra. So tell us about that, please. Well, uh, I actually received an invitation uh, to um, appear on a panel at the African Mission uh, in Washington uh, to basically talk about the great work that we were doing here at Morgan in Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. And the um, ambassador um, um, uh, to the African uh, mission uh, invited me. And so I went and I was on the panel there with about three more people. And we were talking about the great work that we were doing here at Morgan. I had no idea that they had uh, researched my background and uh, they really uh, were very impressed with all the things that we were doing here. And then uh, shortly after that, I received an invitation uh, from the group um, that was being formed uh, called the HBCU Africa Homecoming. Uh, indicating that I had been selected to receive uh, the inaugural uh, top leadership award um, that they would give to uh, HBCU leadership. Um, and it was the Transcendent Order of the African Eagle Award. Um, and that I had to go there to actually get this award in person. Um, and so uh, I kind of struggled with actually whether I was going to go because I had so many things on my calendar. and. My colleagues here said, absolutely, absolutely, David, you have to drop everything, you have to go. This is the year of the return, and this is uh, quite an honor. So I did. I had no idea what to expect. Uh, and so um, during a ceremony there, um, they basically um, uh, sent me to a state uh, that I have never, ever, ever experienced before. Um, it was a, a very, very traditional um, African ceremony that was presided over by the great um, uh, Ashanti kingdom. Uh, and, um, and that included a, uh, a naming for me. And so I've never had a middle name. My parents uh, never uh, gave me a middle name. It's just been David Wilson. And so uh, there they brought out a griot. Um, it was, you know, they draped me in Kente cloth, um, and I could not stop the tears from flowing because uh, I have received so many honors throughout uh, my career, and I really value all of them. But this was not just an honor, it was life changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Griot um, penned a special oration uh, for me uh, that basically went all the way back to my birth on the day that I was born, what was happening on that day, walked through my entire career, and then officially anointed me as David Kwabana Wilson. 
And that is the name that I carry with me right now, officially, Kwabana. Yes. Okay. Very good. So um, congrat congratulations again about that. Um, so Morgan has been leading, um, you know, nationally and internationally. And one of the things you're also leading in is this response to the COVID uh, pandemic that has happened. I uh, looked through your website, which is phenomenal, by the way. Um, and uh, the information that you have is so much, you have so much more information on your website than most colleges and universities, regardless, HBC or otherwise, um, have on their websites. And, and many are not even announcing what they're doing uh, in terms of how they're responding to the crisis uh, until like the end of July or the beginning of August, which I find fascinating as a professor, you know, you might want to know what you're doing, um, you know, before that. So uh, you're ahead of the curve in that uh, respect as well. Can you talk a little bit about um, how, uh, about Morgan's response to COVID, you know, how it impacted your, cam uh, cam how it impacted your camp campus? I don't know why I can't get that word out. Your campus, and then um, how you determine what needed to happen in order to reopen in the fall. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, certainly, the impact of COVID nineteen on our campus uh, is uh, proportionate to the kind of impact it has had on higher education in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Made the same kind of decisions, and uh, that many other institutions in this space made. Uh, in our case, we made them quicker, uh, and so we decided uh, fairly early on that. Uh, number one, uh, our students would not return to the campus after spring break. Uh, number two, uh, we would uh, move instruction to remote uh, and online modalities. And then we would refund back to the students uh, those costs uh, that they had paid for, but they were not receiving. Uh, and so that was the first major decision that we made, and we didn't stumble in making that decision. Matter of fact, the governor of the state of Maryland was so impressed with the rapidity with which we made that decision and the thoughtfulness in which we made it, uh, that he called upon the entire university system of Maryland, of which we are not a part. We are a separate public institution in Maryland to basically follow Morgan's lead. Uh, I then put together a, a team of colleagues here to kind of lead our effort as we moved along in this space uh, and to begin to think about the fall. Uh, we modeled three scenarios, uh, made our way through all of those scenarios, and then we landed on the scenario that we are planning for now for the fall, which is a hybrid model um, where we are bringing uh, individuals back to the campus, but with reduced density, both in terms of our students, faculty, and staff. On the instructional side, uh, we are embracing um, a really a kind of an interesting model, and one of the few institutions to float this, actually, is a live streaming to remote model where uh, we would be uh, offering students um, an opportunity in many classes, not all of them, uh, where they can actually go physically to the campus itself if they're comfortable, or they can stay in their residential hall or stay wherever they are uh, off campus and basically take that class in a remote format. Um, I do want to uh, use this space, though, uh, to give a huge shout out to all of my colleagues here at Morgan, because I'm the president that you are interviewing today. but. You know, we take too much credit uh, for things that um, uh, often come out of our institutions and then too much blame as well. But in this case, um, I don't think that any president or chancellor in the country can be successful in what they do if they don't have a strong team um, around them, uh, surrounding them. And we do have Morgan. I have one of the best leadership teams here at Morgan in the whole country. And I really, really bellow about that. Um, and the person who is really leading our reopening effort uh, is the Dean of our School of Community Health and Policy, Dr. Kimberly Sittenor, who is just an amazing public health official. And she keeps us honest. She's bringing the science to the table uh, and is leading this effort, if you will, with, uh, with you know, great care. Uh, so that is really how we have gotten to where we are. Our provost has done a similar job with regard to working with the faculty and getting the faculty to understand uh, how we can approach what we're doing in a way that it's going to have their safety as well in mind and then have what the students want in mind as well. So this is a work in progress because right now, as we have planned for a reopening in the fall, I said to the cabinet uh, yesterday that I have to spend now the next three days thinking about closing. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we, so, so we're putting a, a lot of effort in how we're going to reopen for the fall. Uh, but also, I'm going to bring to the table next Tuesday, here are my preliminary thoughts. If, for example, we have to move to a space quickly where we don't open 
or we have to move to a space real quickly where we open and then we have to close again. So in, a, in an environment where you just don't know what is around the corner, you have to stay in a perpetual state of planning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when you... Right. So when when you were thinking about this, because COVID is impacting African-American communities and Morgan State is uh, located within a historically African-American community in Baltimore um, uh, and it's impacting us from a health perspective and things of that nature. What are, are there spe- special precautions that you're taking um, that, that you're taking um, relative to the population that you serve and the community you exist within within the community you exist? <laughs> Yes. And so, uh, first of all, we are planning our reopening in phases. And so we have four or five phases. And so the first phase uh, is the return of what I call our frontline colleagues. And these are our colleagues in the physical plant. Uh, These are our colleagues in housekeeping, custodial staff. Um, And uh, most of, I mean, 100 percent of our colleagues in that space are coming from the Baltimore City area. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of them are African-American. Uh, and so we are making available to them, it's about 400 or so, uh, the opportunity to be tested. Um, we have all of the PPE. Uh, I check in with them um, on a daily basis to find out if indeed um, all of that equipment is um, satisfactory to them. I have not heard from any of them that it is not. Uh, and so um, that is basically the first is to make sure that we are providing free testing, uh, and that we are providing all the PPE to our frontline colleagues uh, so we can prevent um, the infection or the spread of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then the second is that we have uh, we, we, we have the highest regard for our colleagues in what we call the physical facilities, physical plan area. They do a great job of maintaining our campus. It's amazing. Yeah, I get like hundreds of, of uh, compliments from people who come to Morgan as to how beautiful this campus is. Uh, and I, they deserve all the credit. Um, and um, in this space, while we have the highest regard for them, but we also went outside and brought in a private company that is specializing in uh, sanitizing all of our facilities on campus uh, using hospital grade materials uh, before we bring back uh, the rest of our colleagues actually to experience the space. And then our own, uh, our own uh, uh, colleagues in the physical plant are being trained by this outside entity to make sure that we keep that up going forward. So um, we are paying um, a lot of attention to uh, the behavioral piece of what we need to do up front, um, making sure we are uh, supplying the equipment that um, our our staff and faculty are needing, uh, and that will be continuously done throughout the entire semester uh, of the fall. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's talk back move back a little bit to your 10th anniversary. And, um, you know, being a college president is stressful. Um, a lot of people do not want that job. You know, if you talk to academics, even faculty, staff, or what have you, the last job they want is to be a college president. So can you, can you tell us what it was about this particular institution that made you say yes to one of the most difficult jobs on the planet? That's a very, very good question because Uh, Prior to my saying yes to Morgan, I had been offered uh, six more college presidencies. Mm -hmm. I I, I was a chancellor within the University of Wisconsin system before I came here and oversaw 13 campuses spread all over the state. And I also oversaw uh, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Public Radio. And so I had gone out to Madison (laughs) with an intent to stay there for 20, uh, 25 years or so and retire. Uh, but I had received six offers to be another uh, uh, to be president of another institution. I said no to all of them. Uh, and uh, Morgan um, was a very special place. I had never visited the campus, um, but uh, Morgan had a very successful president before I arrived. Uh, he had been here for uh, a quarter of a century, 25 years. And so uh, the way I understand this is that when he retired, the board did a national search. Uh, they were not at all pleased, I guess, with the candidates that uh, emerged as finalists. And for some reason they did their research and I got a phone call from a member of the board, uh, the chair of the search committee here saying, look, uh, you don't know us, but we want to get to know you uh, and want you to have a discussion with us about becoming our president. 
And I said, you don't understand, I'm already a chancellor and I'm not interested in leaving. So to make a long story short, she, uh, she was very persistent, Dr. Shirley Malcolm, who was with Triple S, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And you know, Dr. Malcolm, she will not give up. And so she just insisted that, uh, look, what do you have to lose? Can you please just have dinner with me? I'll fly to Milwaukee. And so she did, she flew out to Milwaukee and we had a great dinner. And I thought that was the end of it. And apparently she came back here and told the board, I found our president. Mm -hmm. All she had to do was convince me to come. Mm -hmm. And so I said to her, she called and said, look, um, can you just come and visit the campus? Because I never set foot on the campus. And I said to her, I will only do it on my terms. I don't want any kind of formal interviews. or anything. I need to kind of see what the place, not only what it looks like, but what it feels like, right? And so I flew out to Baltimore one Friday evening, rented a car uh, and, you know, got in the car, had a baseball hat, I turned it back. I had some <laughs> <laughs> and I drove from downtown Baltimore and I'm coming through our neighborhoods in Baltimore. I went, where is Morgan? You know, I get to the stop sign and say Morgan State University this way. And so eventually I got here and I parked the car uh, and I started to walk the campus. And I indiscriminately just stopped students. They had no idea who I was. And I started asking them, so what do you think of this place? Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, I was just blown away. Mm -hmm. So blown away by the brilliance, by the deep reflection, by the sense of belonging that it called into question, why in the hell are you doing what you are doing with all due respect in Wisconsin? I just loved what I was doing there. But, but the way those young people presented themselves to me I saw me. Mm. So you know, I saw I, I saw in them all of this brilliance that in some instances they didn't know they had. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, maybe even with a little bit of arrogance said, um, you know, I have all of these traditionally white institutions that are offering me these leadership opportunities. Um, but why shouldn't why shouldn't Morgan benefit from my A game. <laughs> if I'm going to take my A game to another place, then why shouldn't I take it to Morgan? That's a little bit of arrogance, but but I felt that if they were coming after me the way they were, it meant that they felt that I had something to offer to transform those institutions, and why wouldn't I do that to transform a place where a 70, 75 percent of the students look like me? And I went back uh, to Madison and. I didn't take long and I said to the board now, I think I will have a serious conversation with you. And I came out and we did. And at the end of that conversation, they put a contract in front of me and told me they want an answer in 24 hours. I said, wait, 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 this is moving too fast, right? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 slept, I, I slept on it for uh, about three days uh, and I could not even, I mean, I saw a list of why would I go to Morgan? Why wouldn't I? And I tell you, um, the list in terms of why I wouldn't go, it was all selfish. Mm. Okay. I haven't, I haven't looked back. This is the best decision I've made in my entire career. I, I cannot imagine a career like I was having would have ended without my having been at Morgan. You know, Morgan mm -hmm. has really brought purpose to my career. I, I thought it was, I thought it was a purposeful career when I went to Harvard and got two degrees from Harvard. I thought it was a purposeful career when I you know, became the associate provost at Rutgers. And then when I became the first black person to assume a vice presidency uh, at a predominant white institution in Alabama, at Auburn for 11 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, it was simply about accumulating kind of knots, if you will, you know, on the leadership ladder. But when I came to Morgan, it really was about purpose. Every single day here uh, is unlike the day before because every single day here is a different day. You're touching the life of a student differently. And then you see those students. What, 
I mean, they understand what it means to be a community leader. They understand what it means to be a transformational leader. They understand and they are not, if you will, um, they're not confused. And, and they understand who they are. Yeah. Ready to lead. And I get out of bed every single morning with the biggest smile on my face that you will ever see. Because I'm yeah. coming to touch this. So I'm not sure I, I took that long to answer your question, but uh, that's the first time that someone has kind of asked me that in the way in which you did. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And, and that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, one of my favorite stories about Morgan is um, during the winters when uh, the football team, they go and shovel snow for the people in the neighborhood. And so I thought about, as you're talking about that, every interaction I've had, or even when I walk the uh, campus or go visit my colleagues or friends who were over there, um, you know, it's just, it does. It feels like a, a, a very uh, happy place. It feels like um, things are happening there. Uh, and the students there are very impressive. So when you were saying that to me, I'm, I'm experiencing that as well. I'm remembering um, that part of Morgan State. Um, as well. One of the things that you mentioned um, is that their students, they know that they're leaders. They know that they're global leaders. You know, you have the Global Health Program, you have the Global, the College of Global uh, Communications and Journalism, which is amazing. Um, you have all of these things. Um, and Baltimore is, is really a hotbed, if you will, of political activism. A lot of people who don't live in Baltimore just see these kind of dominant images of Baltimore that are very precarious and what have you. Um, but there is definitely an intellectual um, spirit to Baltimore and existence, um, and also um, an activist bent to of Baltimore. Like I always said, I had the best conversations in grocery stores in Baltimore, just talking to folks who were either in front of you or behind you because, you know, they're buying their groceries, but they, they can tell you what has been happening in the city in regards to a particular neighborhood or policies over the last 25 years. Like you can have that general conversation with somebody in the grocery store in Baltimore. Um, but can you talk about the ways in which um, your students are activists, um, particularly in this climate and the ways in which Morgan State supports students as they fight for justice, as they fight for their rights and the rights of those around them um, at this particular moment, historical moment in our, in our country? You know, uh, most people don't know that this is where the college sit-in movement started in America. Uh, uh, with all due respect to a sister institution in Greensboro, um, mm -hmm. the history books are reflecting the fact that that college sit-in movement started when those four black students uh, refused to leave the Woolworth counter in Greensboro. Well, the college sit-in movement actually started right across the street from Morgan State University in the Northwood Shopping Center, uh, where uh, hundreds of Morgan students uh, went over there. Uh, they were exclusively white owned shops and did not allow uh, blacks to shop there. And those students went into the theater, they went into the barber shops, they went into the ice cream parlors and they refused to leave. Uh, and consequently they were arrested, uh, many of them uh, over, we've documented that over 300 of them were arrested. Uh, they went to jail for several days. Uh, the then president of Morgan, Dr. Uh, Matt, uh, Dr. Dr. Jenkins, um, actually um, bailed many of them out and refused to tell their parents. Uh, and, so, um, and so so, so the, the quest for social justice, the quest you know, for, um, for pushing America to make sure that it is living up to the ideals of the constitution, that all men are created equal, is in the DNA of Morgan. Uh, and so my students are not out there understanding uh, social, obligation, then we're not doing a good job of honoring our history here at Morgan. Uh, and mm -hmm. so um, that's sort of the way that we say to our students, um, you have to be true to history. You know, you are just not here to fill yourself, you know, with the knowledge to enable you to become materially rich. You know, you're here to understand what it means to advocate for those who are not in the house uh, and they have opened the door for you to come in and to have dinner. And you can't be there, if you will, just about eating everything on the menu yourself and not thinking about those who don't have the food. So this piece, if you will, um, is just a part of who we are and our students understand it. So um, since I've been here, I, I have participated uh, in uh, three uh, um, uh, marches for Black Lives and for social justice uh, with our students, with our faculty, with our staff. 
um, going back to uh, the commencing of these horror stories in contemporary times where we were seeing law enforcement officials kill primarily young black men, but young black women too, for no apparent reason. Mm -hmm. And students understood what their obligation was. And it was, wait a minute here, you are killing people for no justifiable reason. And they are young like me, they look like me, and they are trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And when that bubbled up, I was there, if you will, not trying to silence them, but to say to them, as I often say to the students, I support your raising your voices. Because if you don't raise your voice once again, you know, you can't grow the future in silence. Right. You lead the world by being quiet. But I expect you to do that without destruction. And I do say that to them. And when you are embracing this kind of way of changing systemic uh, operations, I'm going to be right there with you. And so uh, I think uh, in today's Baltimore Sun, uh, I have an op-ed there. Um, and the whole notion was around, <laughs> I use some vernacular uh, speech here, but it's, you know, how, how do you stay woke in this position, right? So my son always, you know, say to me, my students as well, he said, well, okay. My son said, daddy, you know, um, I said, what are you listening to? Well, I'm listening to, well, who is that? <laughs> right? So, and so I have to stay woke because I need to know what my son is listening to because this is the way he is. And then my students are not, if you will, going to accept a president who's not in the moment, who's not understanding what they're feeling, who's not understanding um, them in ways that go well beyond, you know, are you acing that, that calculus course? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so uh, I, I just think we're at a moment in this country uh, where our campuses and HBCU campuses in particular uh, that have supported this kind of activism, that have supported this kind of change, we have to lead the way. Uh, and if we don't take advantage of this moment, shame on us. Yes, yes. And just so that you know, shameless plug, if you ever want to do an op-ed for NMPA Black Press USA, we will gladly, gladly have you do it. <laughs> we would love for you to do that, in fact. Um, so, yeah, you spoke about, you know, really being in sync and in touch with um, your students and them knowing their history as well as expecting you to really lead the way, um, if you will, um, in terms of social justice. Which, what academic uh, programming do you have in place um, there that helps students with social justice and civil rights and things of that nature? Can you talk a little bit about those programs? And so uh, this is really infused throughout our entire curriculum, uh, mm -hmm. if you will. And so um, we have, um, of course, it's in the diaspora that are spread throughout the curriculum here. We don't care if you're majoring in engineering or philosophy or political science. Um, this um, is a part of our uh, general education requirements uh, and you actually must take these courses. Uh, you know, now, the, one of the things that I often say is that, mm, and, I, and I hate to once again uh, paint this with a broad brush, but I, as I look at perhaps the differentiating experiences between a student that might go to a TWI and a student that might come to an HBCU. So at the end of the day, you know, what is one of the major differences? One, and, and I think one is that um, you uh, go to a TWI and you take your courses in X, and it is important for you to master those skills. And sure enough, you know, you master those skills. And you come to an HBCU, you take those same courses, you get those same skills, but then you're going to take additional courses to make sure you're okay. Mm -hmm. Can I hop in here real quick? Just so the people who don't know, TWI means traditionally white institution. You might also hear PWI, which is predominantly white institution. Okay, go back. Go. Yes. <laughs> and, and so, and so, I, I often reflect on my own experiences. I majored in political science as an undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, wow, was I well prepared because not only did I read all of the books that my counterparts may have read at whatever, at Harvard, at Stanford, at Yale, but I had to read, in addition to that, books that they didn't read. 
And so not only did I know all of the theories in the way that they knew them, but I also knew it from a black perspective, a white perspective. I, I knew it from your perspective, from my perspective. And that is perhaps what some of the students in the other spaces are not getting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A piece that where the story is also being told from a completely different perspective. And that's what a place like Morgan is doing. And so, yeah, you, 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 you are gaining more here than you would gain from another place because yes, I would say that the requirements are a bit more, but if you don't have that, you're going to have to go someplace when you leave this institution, I think, to get what you would have gotten here because at some point along the way, you know, you're going to be slapped in the face, so to speak, uh, and people are going to want to uh, get you to own uh, a lot of their biases and a lot of the things that they have not been exposed to. Uh, and you're going to struggle with, you know, oh, my God, why am I, you know, in a position where I have to own this? Coming out of Morgan, you're not going to struggle with that. You, you're going to realize that, look, this is their issue. I'm not owning that because I'm okay. Mm -hmm. my, my son is a student here. Uh, and I am so glad that he chose, I'm so glad he chose Morgan. Um, and, and, and I am so glad he chose, quote, unquote, an HBCU. Um, you know, we grew up in cul-de-sacs, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he was the only black kid in this school and the only black. And his mom and I realized that when he finished high school that he, I think he had only had three black teachers. Mm. And it's like, hmm, what? Uh, and so Morgan has been so great for him to be in an environment where uh, during this particular period, he's understanding that, oh, really? Um, it's just not that one black student in the class that must be the valedictorian six times over. Oh, I see 3,000 valedictorians <laughs> who look like me at Morgan every single day. And so, it's, mm -hmm. so, so, and so he, is, he is rinsing himself of, believe it or not, um, of, of implicit bias that perhaps many students don't know they own. Yes. This space, right. And so um, uh, I'm so pleased that uh, that that he is having a very, very good experience. And um, at, at 30, uh, hopefully, you know, he'll be just as OK as his dad was when I was 30. Yes. <laughs> yes. So so um, we have Diane Hawker. Look, Diane, uh, who's an <laughs> Afro, who says you can write an op-ed for her. Now we're bidding for your op-ed. Um, we also have Roosevelt Dist, um, mm -hmm. who says you make me proud to be an alum. Um, you have uh, someone who said, um, that's my president. Um, so just want you to know that people are shouting you out. Oh, Disha Demo, that's my president. Um, <laughs> And I'm she was one of the leaders of the uh, Black Lives Matter um, a movement that we had here, a, a, a demonstration we had here on uh, June 6th as well. So we appreciate her. Fantastic. Yeah. And, I, and I do want to throw out just a huge congratulations to uh, Black Press USA uh, on the 193rd anniversary uh, and, of course, to uh, NPA on the 80th anniversary. You know, if we didn't have uh, the Black Press uh, to tell our stories in the most positive way. Well, let me put it this way. You are telling our stories the way they should be told. Uh, and um, this voice is so important um, because we can't just rely upon the accuracy of, uh, I'm sorry, on, 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 on the uh, authenticity of bringing to our community um, the real positive things that are happening if we did not have the black press there uh, doing this for us. So kudos. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, a lot of people um, don't know that the black press, um, one of the things, I mean, a lot of people know the social justice perspective, they know the activist perspective of the black press, um, but they also um, don't realize that um, the black press also did things that, you know, we, we kind of take for granted. So like wedding announcements, right? We couldn't get those published in mainstream publications ever. They would not put black people in them or birth announcements, right? These idea, you know, the idea that black people are regular folks who live every day and work hard every day, um, you know, was not just being talked about in, in any way that was remotely respectful um, uh, or acknowledged our, our whole humanity. And so the black press has done that 
um, for almost 200 years, which is fantastic. And NNPA, Black Press USA has been doing that for um, 80 years um, and are celebrating their 80th anniversary. But um, can you talk, since we're talking about the press and your op-ed in the Baltimore Sun, can you talk about that fantastic um, global communications program that you have going over there and journalism um, over at Morgan State? Can you tell people uh, about that? Uh, kudos to Dwayne Wickham, our founding dean of the School of Global Journalism and Communication. Uh, Dwayne Wickham was one of the co-founders of the National Association of Black Journalists. Yes. And I was extremely honored uh, to have been able to entice him to come to Morgan and be our founding dean of the School of Global Journalism and Communication. Uh, he has done a phenomenal job. He's grown the school. Um, I think we have about oh, five to 600 students um, who are majoring now in uh, either strategic communications or multimedia platform productions. Um, and they are being sought after by, um, by media firms, public relation firms all over the country. Uh, he has created opportunities for our students to gain content uh, in a global um, environment. Um, they travel you know, to Cuba or to Europe or to Africa, and that's a part of their curriculum there. Uh, and um, he uh, led the school uh, to receive accreditation, a full accreditation, our first time, and we got that announcement about a month ago. Uh, and so uh, we have one of the uh, top programs in the country, the visiting team, they came here, uh, they met with me, they met with the provost, they indicated on their way out uh, that our facilities here uh, are second to none, uh, that we have world-class professors here. We have, I think, uh, two, I know, um, Pulitzer Prize winners on our faculty. Uh, and then we have all of these relationships with um, the black press uh, and uh, and uh, other other uh, forms of the media uh, to ensure that our students are given these opportunities uh, to not only just gain what they need inside of the quote unquote classroom, uh, but uh, to uh, connect that with, uh, with 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 the field, uh, so that when they emerge, they have these kind of skills uh, to uh, honor the profession. Uh, what would I say to um, uh, Dwayne and to our faculty and to our students is that. Um, we want them to be like you. We want them uh, to understand that they are growing up, so to speak, in an environment where the truth is being challenged. Mm -hmm. And that they can't be absorbed by this national nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, that they have to understand that they will be a Morgan graduate and a Morgan graduate in journalism stands fir firmly on journalistic principles. And mm -hmm. you're gonna be hoodwinked into this, well, it's an alternative fact. There's no such thing. And so that's sort of what we want to make sure that the Morgan graduate coming out of our terrific School of Global Journalism and Communication is wearing with honor. Yes, yes. Uh, that made me think about, um, oh, okay. How does your son, uh, we have a question from Diane. How does your son adjust to you being the president and his interaction with other students? You know, I don't think many students on campus actually know that I have a son on campus, right? Uh, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so uh, sometimes I really know I have a son on campus because <laughs> you know, he, uh, he, he makes it a point. He never comes by my office. And um, he doesn't wear that on his sleeve. He has his own set of friends. They don't really talk about that. Uh, I speak about it with him sometimes because I actually thought he was going to go to a school out in Wisconsin. Um, um, but um, as he um, spent his last years here in Baltimore, um, he began on his own to recognize that he needed something that he didn't have. And he made this decision on his own. And I asked him that, Diane. I said, look, what? this is going to be like for you to be on a campus where your father is the president. And, and he said, well, dad, you know, I, I, I just never, ever, ever uh, let that influence me in any way. And so I have a lot of confidence uh, in the fact that um, he goes about his own experiences. He's having his own college experience. Uh, and I'm lucky sometimes if he responds to my text in 24 hours. <laughs> I respond to my text. I just <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So um, let's, 
backtrack just a little bit. Uh, if, if you have questions, please send them because we're winding down. But, um, and I was going to say before that, I thought about Walter Fields, who I call the ambassador of Morgan State University. He loves your school in terms of great people that you produce who are like really exemplary of fantastic journalism, fact-based journalism, and really um, advocating for African-Americans in, in many spaces, you know, behind the scenes and also in the stories that are told. But um, as we as we close out, um, can you tell me, like, I know this is hard as like picking your favorite kid. I know I've heard that before, but can you tell me what's your, you know, your favorite moment? Like, what was your your most favorite moment over? The, and I know it's been a decade. What was your favorite moment as president of Morgan State University? What was like the best thing that has happened to you? There's so many. There's so many. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tell you, I spoke a little bit about implicit bias, and this is what I say. Uh, to friends and colleagues who are in traditionally white institutions uh, and who've been in those spaces for a while and they aspire to lead an HBCU. I say to them, you really do need to understand that in that space, no matter how hard you have been pushing for change, you have picked up some bias. You own some bias that you don't know you own. And so I can recall May of 2011, it was my first commencement ceremony here at Morgan. Uh, and I am standing there on the podium in the Hughes Stadium, you know, 15,000 people in the audience, over 1,200 students graduating in that setting. Um, and we get to the moment where we are about to bestow the degrees and we introduce the deans of the 10 colleges here to come forward to introduce the candidates um, who, <laughs> who will come across the stage and shake my hand. And so dean after dean came forward, Mr. President, dean, I'm pleased to present these candidates who have satisfied all of the requirements for the degree Bachelor of Science in. Will you please stand? And so all the candidates on the field would stand. And, um, and then the next team would come. So then we got up to former Dean Eugene Deloach, the founding dean of the renowned School of Engineering here at Morgan. And he came to the podium and he said, Mr. President, I'm pleased to present to you these candidates who have satisfied all of the requirements for the degree Bachelor of Science in the Clarence M. Mitchell Jr. School of Engineering. Will you please rise? And I looked on the football field and Dr. Burton, I saw 150 or so black faces. And in the moment, this is being video streamed. So I turned and I said, um, was that a mistake? You did say, did you say engineering? Right? I'm like, oh, wait, wait, why did you say? Because I, I hadn't seen that picture before. Um, I mean, I hadn't seen that picture since I left Tuskegee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that had been, what, 25 or so years. And so while I'm on the stage at Auburn, while I'm on the stage in Wisconsin, while I'm, I mean, when a black student came across the stage in some of these fields, I would get, I'd be the only black person on the stage. I would get up and, I mean, give them the kind of hug at the time, pre-COVID, <laughs> <laughs> where it's like, well, I didn't want to let them go. It was like my son or daughter, right? And I had kind of um, internalized this whole notion that there are so few, there are so few uh, who are prepared to enter this institution and graduate which is a whole lot of crap. And here I am, I'm looking at a hundred or so who are ready to go on into any program in the country to do a map. I mean, Lockheed Martin and Norfolk Grumman and all these corporations are knocking on the door. That was a moment amongst 10,000 moments. Mm -hmm. and one of the earlier moments where I realized this is the right place for me. Yes. 
Yes. Oh my gosh, I'm teary. I'm trying to make it. Okay. Oh, yes, that was a beautiful story. Um, I mean, I can't even I can't thank you enough, Dr. Wilson. Um, oh, one one more question. You just got in. We're about to close. Is Morgan Athletics, this is from Mark Shaves, thinking about leaving the MIAC conference? That's a controversial question. We're gonna end on a controversial question. Uh, uh, we we are uh, at this point committed to the MIAC. Oh, okay, very good. Um, although CIAA will be coming to Baltimore very soon. Uh, <laughs> all right, so um, Dr. Wilson, this has been a fantastic, fantastic experience. Um, I'm not sure if you saw, but so many of your alums were coming in and saying um, such fantastic things about you. You also had some folks, uh, someone said Tuskegee's in the house. Um, so from some of your other institutions where you played a major role, um, thank you, Diane. Diane said, said, said I did a great interview, a fantastic interview. Thank you, Diane. So what I want to do is invite Diane, Diane, and you, of course, um, to our virtual conference, which is going to be happening July 7th and 8th. You know, I got a plug. Um, it's virtualnmpa2020.com. And the rest of our viewers, of course, it's free. Um, I know y'all have stuff to do, but we will be celebrating and we'll also have some amazing uh, panels, particularly on entrepreneurship and um, being a publisher and how to be a be better publisher. Um, for those who don't know, NMPA is the oldest um, organization for black publishers in the country, probably in the world. Um, so, you know, um, I'm sorry, and I got the dates wrong. It's July 8th and 9th. I said 7th and 8th, but it's the 8th and 9th and it's free. So, of course. Dr. Wilson, because you don't have anything else to do. We want you to come to our conference virtually um, and tell everyone um, to come uh, and to be a part of that uh, historic moment. But this was a fantastic interview. I appreciate your time, uh, especially during this um, very intense period of leadership. And um, we would love to have you back one, one day in the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. And we will see you next week.